We're nearing the end of the regular season now. This is the final week before playoffs, Wolf. The final countdown. And we have a big upset. A rarity within the LCK. An upset. Uh, which is Hanwha Life beating T1. But it won't be enough to actually put them in second place. So does it matter, Wolf? No, I mean, it's interesting for playoffs implication, that's for sure. Uh, because... <laughs> We still do kind of have a little bit of a tier list um, below Genji and T1 in that Hanwa uh, should be stronger than KT and D+. Um, and whoever gets 6th place, which is still up in the air, likely to be Fear X at this point, but could be Kwangno Freaks as well. Um, I think D+, also looking really interesting this week, obviously with their series against Genji that ended up being pretty exciting. Uh, albeit very weird and D plus looking in some aspects incredibly good in other aspects just way outclassed in terms of macro uh and a little bit indecisive on engages like lucid knew what he wanted to do but anyway i digress um the the t1 series was pretty interesting because it felt like it was just owner mostly getting outclassed by peanut who had an incredible series and there have been some some warning signs for owner over the last few weeks, for sure. I think against weaker opposition, some of those are tougher to see. And I think his, you know, team fights have often been carried by his team just being super far ahead, having positional advantages on on objectives like dragons and barons, and it's he's had an easy job. Um, but in this series against Hanwa, Peanut kind of ran the show uh, a lot and. Also, Zekka looking good on Talia is not something I thought I would ever say. Like, those words came out of my mouth, but he actually ended up picking up um, MVP in that third game on the Talia. Had some really good flips, some nice weaver walls. And Hanwha look like they've kind of figured out how they want to play. And it's kind of, weirdly enough, just adopting T1's play style and playing it a little bit better than T1 did. <laughs> Again, into T1 at least. Well, I, you know, I think with T1, because a lot of people are going to hear our takes on how and why they've slipped up a little bit in the past couple of weeks versus Gen G and, uh, and now Hanwha Life, because certainly they're, they're going into the playoffs with a couple of pretty key losses that make you wonder how deep of a run they can actually accomplish. And, you know, after, after we saw the series versus Gen G, um, we haven't seen that much of a mix-up with T1. And I think one of the things is, that's very crucial to mention about T1 is that they are an excellent team at playing through pressure in the bot side. And we got to see that in the game two versus Hanwha that they played where Viper and Delight were pushed under the turret. This allows owner to invade into the bot side and try and shut Peanut down. Um, and it was a much more successful game for T1. Uh, it was also the game that they banned the Jace because they love blind picking the Aatrox for Zeus. But as we saw in the Gen G series, uh, you know, when you start picking ranged top laners, and there are a bunch of them right now until the Twisted Fate nerfs come through um, onto, onto the, into the professional scene, we have the Jace, we have the Twisted Fate, we have the Tristana now that's been played a couple of times in the top side that may be an option. And it is making it hard for Zeus to blind pick Aatrox unless they also deploy bans against Jace and some of these other champions. Um, and not only that, but we, we got to see once again, Wolf, just the ineffectiveness of Galing picks at times with T1 because they went back to the Zeri, which is a champion that Gumayushi has never been good on, even in the best of times, even the most broken Zeri of times. He was no ruler. He was no pays. He was no aiming when it comes to this champion. And they had a chance, Wolf. I was doing a VOD review on my stream, and I was just screaming to pick Jinx in R5, and they just fucking pick Zeri. And I'm like, why are we, why are we doing this? Jinx is your pick, Gumiyushi. Do you want a free lane for Jinx versus Smolder? Doesn't do it. Plays a terrible Zeri game. Like, this guy actually just can't even shoot Q in the right direction on this champion. You, you watch him play it. And he just doesn't do it well mechanically. And then Viper just dominates on Smolder, goes 10, 0, and 6, completely wipes the floor with T1. And you, you got to wonder, like, if the Senna's banned, what, what is their scaling pick? Because right now we're in the, sca we're in the stale scaling stalemate bot lane. So you, you either need to ban the Smolder 
or have an option here that isn't Senna. And I, I just don't think the Zeri is it for T1. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. I mean, you can get away with that against weaker teams, obviously. Um, Guma Zeri is good enough for that, but it has been kind of pretty consistently not good enough um, in, in top tier matches. Playoffs in the Zeri meta, as you said, he rarely played it. And when, in those games he did, there were some occasional good ones, but for the most part, he looked very uncomfortable on the pick. I like the Jinx for him. Um, and Zaya has been a comfortable one for him, although I don't think that pick is very strong right now in the meta. It's weird because I think Zeri is one of the best skirmish um, champions in the game in that if you are in control of a, you know, random dragon fight, second dragon, third dragon kind of thing, and T1 has a little bit of control and Faker's roaming, they are so good at that type of game. And Zeri is so good at just kind of sliding in over the wall, ulting people and just cleaning up kills. And like, it feels like it's a perfect champion for T1. But Guma just doesn't. He, he's not good at it. Um, he's he's done some crazy stuff with Zaya in those types of moments. Obviously, the Jinx as well, similar style, right? That you mentioned. Um, just simply because if you get that initial pick, you get excited. Jinx does a ton of damage. You clean up the fight, and we've seen so many moments um, for him on that pick. The Aphelios also another strong pick for him, but a little bit less meta right now, uh, with just how things are shaking up with how many different engages there are to potentially punish the Aphelios. He doesn't do what Smolder does. Uh, Viper's stacking speed in that final game was also insanely high. Um, he was able to to farm that up very quickly. And it was kind of bonkers how T1 fought into the Smolder and how desperate they looked. And I don't know. I, I feel like this series was not on any particular player necessarily. I think Owner probably had the, the worst of it. Zayas didn't perform as well. And then Guma and Zeri is a little bit uncomfortable. But I think T1 looked exposed in that it, it very much showed that they kind of had one playstyle all season long. And if Hanwha just changed something even slightly, they were like not the same team. They were not as good as they were at playing the same thing over and over and over again. A dominating bot lane, roaming faker, Aatrox, no resources, top side, but Zayas gets it done. They did that basically all season long with no <laughs> exceptions. And then when Hanwha was like, hey, what about this? They were like... Ooh, that's uh, that's a little bit different. And I think T1 might have taken this series also as a bit of a test to see if they could play against a good team um, and, and change it up a little bit. And it, was it a complete failure? No, but, you know, you, you lost to Hanwha. You might lose to Hanwha in playoffs if you play like this um, going forward. You might lose to D+, if they play as well in the early game as they did uh, against Gen.G yesterday. So it no longer feels like it's a default, okay, we're going to the finals, T1, Genji, no one else is as close as them because Hanwha also leveled up. And I think Peanut played very well. Like, Owner had some some issues, but Peanut also played very well. Viper is very good in this meta. He's good at all the scaling picks. So, I mean, Doran uh, is Doran, so, you know, you never know. But <laughs> Hanwha do look like they, they could be a, a relevant team that could make a cool run. D-plus look like they're a team that could maybe potentially make a cool run. Um, and KT is still fraudulent, still on fraud watch on that one. I don't think they're going to be the ones that, that, that make a cool playoff run, but I do have my eye on, on Hanwan D plus right now. Oh my God. You, you're actually jumping on, on board with D plus. No. I mean, look here, here's the thing. I, I guess we will move on and talk about the D plus Gen G series real quick because everyone was like, it's lucid. He's, he's back. It's lucid from challengers. This is the lucid. That is not lucid from challengers. Actually lucid. Well, I mean the early game a little bit. Yes. Um, but I think he and showmaker really started to figure out how to play together. Obviously they played the Lee Sin Annie, um, which is pretty easy mid duo to play, but he was making aggressive plays. Third game definitely got punished for it. Chovy outplayed them really hard, but he was playing aggressively there, but the kick plays in um, the late game where he was isolating targets and killing them and kicking them into King in and they're pulling them through walls and doing stuff like that. We never saw that uh, from Lucid and Challengers because he was never in games where he had to clutch. He was never, oh, it's late <laughs> game and I need to actually make an incredible play. It was, oh, it's late game. I'm just going to run down mid with my team and then engage and we win because we're such a dominant team that and we're so ahead. We're like 8,000 gold ahead 90% of our games. I don't even have to do anything. It's just a autopilot. So instead of being anti-clutch, as he was a lot of the uh, season so far, where he was like, okay, we're in a desperate situation. I'll fix it. And then just totally messed it up. Um, like on Sejuani, for example. On Lee Sin, at least, 
I mean, and he did play three games with Lisa, and so there's a little bit of an asterisk there. He uh, he looked good, and he was able to find the angles. And, and yeah, they ultimately did end up losing the series, but um, Lucid actually looked really relevant. Showmaker looked relevant in the first two games, and the third game, not so much. But uh, D-plus, I think, came with a clear draft plan, and I think at a best of five, you know, if they have a slightly better read and a slightly better consistent late game, then maybe... You know, something some magic could happen. I'm not saying they're gonna they're gonna do it, Monty. I'm just saying they I, I thought it was absolutely no chance they would do it. And now I'm like, oh why why is it that even when we change like the majority of the players on D plus and Gen G, these regular season meetups are still always so crazy close. It feels like even though again, most of the players are different on this roster, it always is like, okay, D plus is mediocre or Dom one is mediocre. Gen G is on top of the league. And yet when they meet, whatever D plus roster actually just levels up, plays a much better game than we're used to seeing, and then actually challenges Gen G and then loses in the end. It's like the same narrative, even though it has, you know, half of the players that are still in those in these yeah, rosters. It has no rights to be it has no right to be, but it ends up happening every time. We were talking about it yesterday. Um before the series even started, we were like, I don't know, the series could just be a banger because that's what D plus does. Um I think the answer is you know, this is just my theory, but I think the answer is because D plus really cares about this matchup. I think it's obviously a matchup that um, has historical precedence for them going to the three games all the time, battling with them against playoffs or battling against them in playoffs. Uh, Sonny's going the distance there as well. And I think for Showmaker in particular and the coaching staff, this is a series where they prepare super hard because they know that it mean would mean a ton um, to the fans. And it also means a lot for their standings as well with them battling for KT rolls or upset wins uh, do help them potentially get fourth place. Uh, I think it just meant a lot and they prepared super hard for it um, and in this case. And it didn't ultimately work out, but they had a different read this time around and it almost got them a series win. It was very close. Uh, it definitely could have gone their way that third game, especially the late game, which went wildly back and forth. Uh, and I hate when games like this are decided by Elder Flip, but that is just what Gen G got us because their macro is way better than D pluses. Sadly for D plus, <laughs> um, but it was kind of ridiculous. It was their kind macro of ridiculous. Is way better than D pluses, and, and I and you could just feel the aiming um, drain of all of the money off of the map. Uh, people are starting to finally actually figure it out. Like I've I've seen like people commenting about this on Reddit and like. Those are people. Yes, posting on Twitter he's the well. highest resource AD carry in the league. He's crazy. He always has been this guy. Yeah, he, he always is. And like, it's funny because people were trying to like shit on Showmaker. Like, he's just not, he can't even see us. Look at his numbers. And then everyone was coming out and being like, aiming took his money. <laughs> aiming took <laughs> everything. People are starting to figure it out. People are starting to realize. We've been staying it here aiming, on this show for a long time, but people are starting to. to aiming, aiming literally takes the highest percentage of gold in the LCK of any ADC like, and bull takes the least. Now, part of this is how many times has somebody played fasting Senna, right? Yeah. But uh, here's another stat for you. Aiming has played four games of Senna and he's still the top percentage gold AD carry in the league, right? Um, he also takes the highest percentage of CS after 15 minutes. He has the highest overall CS per minute in the league. Um, so, yes, he is an enormous, enormous resource drain. Um, and he actually, in terms of damage percentage, is fifth lowest in the league. And damage, per But damage percentage after 15, he's behind Teddy, Jiwoo, Viper, and Aiming. So, you know, he at least is outputting the damage after 15 minutes when he is getting all of that CS. And it also means that when you look at some of these compositions, like you look at D-plus's comp and you're like, Cassante, Leeson, Annie, Zaya, Rakan. Like that means he has to do all of the damage in the late game um, because they just don't have a mid laner or a jungler or a top laner who's going to be outputting an insane amount of damage. Um, and so the onus was on him and he kind of didn't deliver, which is why I don't really like when Showmaker is the best performing player on this team that he's just stuck on Annie and Karma for a lot of these games. Yeah. I do think, I mean, Annie seems really strong right now just because she can get you prio and almost sure. match up, not necessarily Tristan. Oh, I agree. I'm not saying Annie's weak. I'm saying for this, the purposes of this team, aiming has been 
unreliable in spite of the amount of resources he takes. And if I would, because Showmaker has been their best performing player, I would rather see him on higher damage output champions because even though Annie is good, I agree, it hasn't translated into series wins for D+. Now, next week, we go to the next patch, 14.5, I believe it is. Um, So... And then I think we're moving even to another patch after that for for playoffs. So yeah, it should be fourteen six for playoffs. I would yeah. assume just based on timing. Yeah. So the um, Azir will be back uh, into the forefront of the meta. Well, we'll see if if players end up liking to pick him. But I assume that will be the case, as is almost always the case for League of Legends all, across all time, as the Azir will be relevant. But I think the fact that Showmaker got that taken away from him somewhat randomly as well considering that teams didn't really know about the bug that was happening until the last moment and then we even had like one game at the beginning of the week where we're like oh it's a thing um you can play as ear and then we were like wait no and as like lck discovered this bug and then it ended up being disabled and will again be re-enabled next week um maybe azir ends up being something that he can play that he ends up getting more consistent impact in fights but also gets to do the damage output because he was the tank Azir guy. Maybe he can bring that back. It's a very weird meta where we went from, um, you know, Azir being the king and Quirky being the king because they have so much impact in team fights with package, with Emperor's Divine, with damage, etc. Into uh, it's just the engage bot mid um, where it's like Talia, you know, engage or Talia Weaver's wall or. Oriana or now Ari and Annie, um, and then damage doesn't matter. So. I mean, obviously, if you have gold on, you know, some of these picks, it is going to help you get a more consistent team fight. The Ari, for example, if it's extremely fed, can just instantly kill someone. Um, but I understand the, the thought process behind giving, aiming all the money. I just don't really like Zaya that much. I think it's really difficult to carry on Zaya in a meta where there's so many engaged champions. Um, and there's there's so many different things that, yes, you can press R once. But that's it. Like, Cass- <laughs> like we said, how many times have we seen Cassante just walk towards Azaya and she has to press R because she's so l- low range? Um, it's it's not really safe. It's it's not really strong to be honest. I'd rather see something that's longer range. Um, I'd rather see something that's way more high potential late game carry. Um, if you're going to be giving all the money to the, to to aiming. It's just not the meta it was last year where you could get away with the Zaya and pop off with it. It's just too tough. Um, and then Zaya is terrible in lane in most matchups right now and gets hard countered by Poke, Jace's meta again. So please stop picking Zaya, LCK teams. I don't want to see it anymore. It's a, it's such a prevailing um, thing that in the LCK. That even I remember when the Zaya was locked in in that game, the LCK staff, like even like camera people were like, oh, because everyone was like, everyone wanted to see the upset, right? Like everyone was kind of like, oh, this is actually a pretty hype series. Everyone walked into it thinking it was going to be a 2-0 stomp for Gen G. This I walked in. It's just like even cameraman bro was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, they brought me to three and I, now I don't have to, and now I can't go home early. And then they locked in Zaya. Really? They brought me to three for this. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it. I don't necessarily hate it, perhaps as much as you do, but I mean, in top regions right now, it is not the greatest pick. Um, I, I like I'm looking at the win rates for it at the moment, uh, and let's see here, it's currently at a forty six percent win rate. So, I mean, not amazing. It's 38 and 44 in top regions so far this spring. But I agree. I think compared to many of the other win rates that we see on top 80 carries, it is disappointing. I'm actually, I'm curious about the LCK win rate specifically because I feel like it's much worse. In fact, I'm going to see if I can look this up really quick. Um, Just because... The top teams aren't really picking it. I mean, we're seeing it a little bit more these days, but Sorry, um, get a lot of the weaker teams have picked it into top teams and gotten owned. So I'm guessing it's probably like 30, 35. Would be 33%. Probably... It's 10 and 20. So I was kind of on the money on that one. Um, yeah, it's... 
I mean, it's just a pick that's super easy to counter in draft as well. Teams are picking it early. Like it's if it's first rotation, Zaya, you've just conceded the the draft in this meta, right? In past metas, it's like first rotation, Zaya, Rakan is super strong. There's so many different things you can do in team fights, but not right now. Um, there's just, I mean, Cassante is so good into Zaya. I mean, I, I there's, I, I'm not gonna go on a rant about this, but just please, I don't want to see it anymore. Is 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 my like <laughs> call call to the LCK teams? Like, please, please stop. Um, so Kwangdong. Um, they are right now still on their lose everything and go six twelve um train. They did end up taking a game off Hanwa, which was very surprising. Uh, especially going into the the Hanwa T one series, like Hanwa was not looking so hot. And then they took a game off Firex, um, who if they beat either of these teams, Firex is out, and that's just the end of it. So that was a really fun series in that it had massive playoff implications. Um, it was not a fun series to cast because the gameplay was not good. But Kwangdong is now still on track, right? Assuming they lose to D plus and KT for going six and twelve after we were very five high and three. Good reason. Yeah. Five and three to six and twelve. Um and they it, had it, good wins during that that run in the beginning of the season. Yeah, D plus and KT both. Very strong wins. I mean, this team is depressing in terms of how far they've fallen. I, I really feel like they're trying to do too much at this point in time. Like CB Max is trying to do too many picks for this composition and this group of players because they seem to have just, you know, when they were at their best, they were running like, okay, let Cuz and Umzi run the show. Let's put, uh, let's put Bulldog onto Huey or Corky or Azir or a long range kind of carry. Let it, it, let's just get him through the laning phase where he's not the strongest and he'll pump out damage in the late game. And we'll try and get Bull some kind of like decent matchup in the bot lane. But also Andil has not looked as good since coming back from that break either, which has been a pretty important factor. Yeah, not entirely sure what's going on with Andil, but he he took that very short break when Quantum came in and he just hasn't been the same since. I think part of this is they're constantly getting the Callista banned against them. And so Bull hasn't looked as good at other picks and his scaling picks have been pretty poor and their laning phases when he's playing um, late game picks have been very poor. And so Andal as a result, you know, ends up looking worse, but his like mid to late game has also been pretty bad when they have agency, he's kind of coming up empty. So that's not great. Um, I, I think, you know, when you consider Fear X's remaining schedule, they have Nongshim and Bro and, those are not default wins by any means with how Firex has been playing this season. Um, but they, they should be winnable. I think Firex is going to go instead. And at this point, like, I'll say two things. One, I'm, I'd rather have Firex because Kwang Lun just doesn't look salvageable at this point. And this is not the Firex that we were championing and we were excited about earlier. It's not no longer an exciting team. Um, whereas Firex execute is silly, and that's interesting. Um <laughs> And also, I don't really care. I mean, Fear X's road is significantly easier, though, because it was yeah. really up to Kwangdong to, like, pick up one win out of these four one games. Game. Yeah, it was up to them to just win one time. <laughs> and it's not over yet, because here's here's the facts, guys. So if Kwangdong, basically Fear X's best placement is 7 and 11, and Kwangdong could also tie at 7 and 11, but because of the game differential, because Fear X is negative 12 and Kwangdong is negative 7, if Kwangdong wins one, then they'll just win on game differential. So it won't really be a big deal. But Kwangdong, you know, they basically either have to hope that Fear X loses to either Breon or Nongshim, or they win, like, or we see Kwangdong beat D plus or KT again which is a lot harder to do than just finishing up and beating Fear X. So it was very embarrassing that they didn't actually win that game versus Fear X uh, this week. Or, you know, I don't know, Wolf, DRX or like one of the Breon games, just just one, just one of the two Breon matches. Yeah. And it, the, the other thing I was going to say is like, I, I'd rather see Fear X, but the other thing is it, it, it doesn't matter that much. Like we're we're going into week nine, being like, "Ooh, which team is going to lock up that playoff spot?" I mean, it matters for the org. It matters for the fans uh, of Fear. Yeah, but that team is just going to get popped get, get... by either T one or Hanwa, who is yeah. ever in that third place spot. Yeah. Probably likely, Hanwa. Likely Hanwa, but Hanwa will not lose a best of five against either of these teams. So, frankly, <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. 
I, I think like, I, I don't think they'll win. Yeah. I don't think they'll lose a game against either of these two teams. I, I frankly, I do not. I do not think it matters that much. We've had seasons where in the past, like bro, when they were vying for playoffs and they had some really cool, interesting early game stuff we were doing, you, you could make an argument. This season, it's just not. No, the Furex drafting is poor. The um, the overall game plan, gameplay, and game plan is super predictable with with execute, and it's, it's not going to happen. Um, maybe try again next summer. Um, but well, look, look, Wolf. I think now is a great time to talk about our sponsor because we not, may not be ex- excited about the prospect of Hanwha versus Firex or Kwangdong as a stage one playoff match. But what is tantalizing is our sponsor, Factor, for you. That's right, guys. Um, every week it's. It, they deliver you fresh meals in a box, never frozen, by the way. So ship directly to your door. It includes Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto meals. And you have 35 different options to choose from. They heat up in just two minutes and are better for you, most likely, than the takeout you are buying. And they are, I will tell you, certainly cheaper. So if you find yourself at home trying to order some takeout food, well, you're paying for the delivery fees, you're paying for the tips, you're paying more money. This is a way that you can, if you don't feel like cooking right then and there, get a healthier option and get a cheaper option that you can purchase in advance and you select your meals every week. You can pause it at any time you want um, and reschedule your deliveries depending on your schedule. So if you're out for a couple weeks, just hit the pause button and come back and your subscription will still still be going. So you can also add to your box pancakes, smoothies, a bunch of other add-ons, snacks, everything like that. So they've got you covered. So head to factormeals.com slash MontyWolf50 and use code MontyWolf50 to get 50% off. That's code MontyWolf50 at factormeals.com slash MontyWolf50 to get 50% off. And you, of course, you can cancel at any time too. So get your 50% off. Give it a shot. What have you got to lose? Uh, thank you very much to Factor. And again, spon- you know, helping our sponsors, supporting our sponsors, guys, to, is the best way to support our shows here at Last Free Nation. So we appreciate it when you guys use our codes like MontyWolf50 at FactorMeals.com. Thank you. So thank you very much to Factor. Great option for you guys. Um, and we're ha- happy to have them on with the show. So, Wolf, what do you want to discuss next? The playoff race in general? Because we talked about T1 and Hanwha a little bit, but why that match doesn't really matter is they're both at 13 and 3, but T1 is plus 20 games and Hanwha is plus 16. And the next week, T1 is playing Nongshim and DRX. So it seems very unlikely that Hanwha, who's playing KT and D+, much more likely to drop games against those teams, um, even if they both go 2-0, T1 will have the game differential. And that's why unless T1 takes a massive upset loss this week and Hanwha beats two tougher opponents to, you know, 2-0, um, it's yeah. very unlikely that we're going to see T1 fall out of that second place seed. And it's very unlikely that uh, Gen G will um, drop down to second place as well. Uh, their remaining matches are DRX and Bro. Uh, so that's not really even a, that, that's not even a worth, you know, conversation to have. Um, I would say that it will be at least slightly interesting casting next week because it, you do have to win those. And, but I just don't think that Gen G will mess it up. Um, Gen G. Actually, if they win both of their remaining series, we'll have a perfect round two uh, in terms of, of winning all mm-hmm. of the series. And they've only dropped one series uh, for the entire season. So to KT, surprisingly. Season. Yeah. If they just didn't if they just didn't let Senna through, could have had the perfect 18-0 season. Um, but that that's wild, right? That that Genji actually has this insanely dominant season. It's not surprising in the context of what we've been watching the last, you know nine weeks um but it is surprising <laughs> in the context of wow the lck just couldn't beat Gen G, um with the exception of kt that one time uh and then obviously the t1 the t1 versus hanwa playoff implication um stuff like you said it's very unlikely but it is the most important of the potential different swaps we could have because you could also have kt and d plus um swap between fourth and fifth 
but as it turns out, they'll just be playing against each other. So it doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't actually matter. And because and because teams select their next opponent, right? It doesn't matter who's fourth or fifth because it, it, it with the teams picking the seed is not going to be relevant because they could be a sixth seed. And if a team doesn't want to face them, then we're not going to have that pick. It, it, you just remember like in previous years, guys where Gen G would avoid picking D plus, even though D plus was often the worst seed because the matchup between them and Gen G was often much closer in the regular season. So they just kind of pushed that one aside. Yeah. So they have the opportunity to just deny that, um, you know, at any point because they, well, assuming they get first place, which, does seem likely at this point. Um, Genji is also locked for top two. Um, there's no way mm -hmm. in which they do not get that. So, um, because Hanwa is uh, nine games behind them, it is not possible for them to um, catch up. So, the uh, and, and obviously for like KT to get in there either um, because they're ten and six. So, it does seem like we're kind of moving into playoffs with a pretty good idea about what it's going to look like and again the one question mark being fear x kwangdong but you know it's not that interesting considering those get bopped by hanwa um and it's it's a bit early to actually talk about playoffs themselves because i think we do need to watch one more week of play um for all these teams and see what their read on the next patch is going to be because while next week probably won't be that exciting in terms of upsets and, and movement in the standings it will show us what teams think is good on 14.5, which my expectation is will be mostly the same um, with with a few different um, tweaks coming through. And uh, I'm going to be diving into the patch uh, myself tomorrow and, and really getting an idea about what I think is going to be good. I haven't even looked at it that much because I've been so busy this week. But the um, the rest of the LCK, I think, based on this week, though, right, based on the fact that we did see uh, Hanwha upset T1, and then we did see D plus play a close series against Gen G. Uh, could be the playoffs could be more interesting than we think. Um, and it might not just be the the doomsday uh, T one versus Gen G again. Gen G wins four <laughs> trophies in a row. No, I, so here's the thing, Wolf. I think T one is going to figure their shit out by the time it comes to playoffs because they have been individually quite good, and I think they can overcome this. And also, you know, fortunately. The, the the death of Smolder will be happening probably by the time playoffs happen, which is really going to change the bot lane meta probably in a direction back to where it's good for T1 because so much of the bot lane meta has been warped by Smolder's presence where it's like, all right, now we're in a scaling arms race with different AD carries because we're either going to play Senna or Zeri or Jinx or whatever into Smolder or Zaya into Smolder. And if Smolder's gone, then that warping effect he has on the meta is also going to end at the same time. And I think we go back to a bot lane meta that's going to be much more preferable overall. Also, the loss of Azir definitely does hurt T1 because that has been one of Faker's go-to champions and provides, you know, that stability in terms of laning high damage in the mid and late game. Um, as well as engage potential that T1 really valued. And so, you know, I think T1, it, many teams are are hurt by Azir not being there, but the lack of Azir is definitely warping the mid lane meta as well. So both of those things happening, I think will probably cause T1 to get back on track a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I assume so as well. And there's um there's always the, you know, D plus angle of, they're sometimes very smart on new patches. Maybe they can do something as well on, uh, you know, 14.5 and then the 14.6 that's forthcoming for the uh, playoffs. So they keep an eye on them. It is exciting to see Lucid play well because obviously he's a rookie and he was on a team that was so dominant that, like, watching him play, you could see his mechanics in the early game, but he was playing in a meta where early game stomps are how you win the game and he was doing it and his bot lane was doing it and it was very easy to see that he had potential but it, he wasn't fully tested obviously he came to the lck was tested challenged a lot d plus is not a top team or wasn't for a majority of the season um you know there were even questions about whether, whether or not they would make playoffs um when we were in like week three week four we're like oh this team is looking very rough and he's had a lot of moments where he's basically just ran it down trying to make a play to save his team and then costing them everything, which, you know, every jungler knows this moment where you're like, well, I got to check vision because I'm the tank 
and my support is a squishy and cannot get in there. So I'm going to walk in on stage Wani and then get instant blown up. And then everyone's going to hate me online after this because, you know, they think it's my fault. And he's had some moments where he's just kind of flashed in and, and whiffed it. He, he's, he didn't have a good season. He just didn't. But he had a good series against Genji. And now that Lucid seems to be a little bit more confident, I don't know what happened, what, you know, between their last match against T1 and then this Gen G match or what happened between week seven and week eight and what the coaches are telling him. Cause Zepha, I see him talking to him all the time, um, you know, between breaks and stuff like that. Um, seems like the, they are giving him a ton of feedback, but I'm glad that he's finally reaching the, some of the hype potential that we, we had for him because he was coming in as such a strong player. And I think for me, that that is like the one thing I'm really tracking next week is what what does D plus do? Because they have obviously a pretty interesting schedule in, in Kwangdong and HLE next week. So I, I'm just going to have my eye on them to see if they are able to, to if they take a dominant win over Kwangdong, which again, Kwangdong's not really beating anybody right now. But if they can take a dominant clean win, shore up some of the macro problems they had against Genji there, and then play a decent game against Hanwha, then I look at them as a as a potential you know dark horse of of playoffs, but they obviously have to prove it next week. But if they can carry that momentum forward, then you know maybe this team is interesting. Maybe this team is is worth caring about. Um, I'm I'm kind of over caring about KT. They burn me too many times, and <laughs> like for KT, we didn't talk about KT that much this week. It's like, oh, Piyoshi got a penta kill at 14 minutes because the game is dumb and like the game state is stupid, and <laughs> and then otherwise like just. Just like their series on what was it yesterday or two days ago against DRX where they almost lost to DRX and that game was also silly and they struggled to to actually close that one out quickly. Uh, the consistency is just not there. Um, I love this roster. I love how happy they are when they play together. I love um, the kind of family vibes that KT gives off and Piyoshik is yelling and laughing and Barrel is shot calling at a million miles uh, an hour, but. I just don't think they're going to get it done against the top three teams in the LCK in this playoffs. Um, so I'm much more interested in D plus right now as my kind of TLDR and that T that, that D plus versus KT matchup in playoffs, considering how they, how close they played each other in both of their regular season matches is going to be fiesta. bonkers. It's going to be so stupid. But Guys, if you missed, if you missed the second round, Robin D plus versus KT, it was fucking terrible. Like it was, it was. It made my eyes bleed to watch it. We had two fifty-plus minute games. Um, KT absolutely should have won that series, considering that they kind of dominated game number two and they just couldn't close out game one or three. Um, but I mean, both these teams have pretty poor mid to late game macro, and so it just turns into a complete clown fiesta. And it will be probably exciting, but it won't be good League of Legends. No. Um, uh, it will be very funny and it will be very stupid. And, uh, I don't know what, what, uh, playoff matches I'm, I'm casting it, obviously, cause it's a ways away. I'm hoping I'm casting that one just because I think it'll be really fun <laughs> and, um, and obviously really tense cause it does have big implications for, um, you know, who's, which team will be picked, um, going into round two. So if you actually do play well as either KT or D plus, you might avoid getting, uh, Gen G. Um, they might be scared of you. Genji has been kind of scared of D plus in these moments in the past. So. No, it was surely not. Well, surely Hanwha just wins three zero, and then nobody picks Hanwha, and they pick KT or D plus. Well, you remember last uh, last season when um, the the KT pick ended up being that's because Faker was injured and was out and could play like two champions at that time. Yeah, uh, that I... that then KT didn't ban. Okay, <laughs> don't don't use that as some sort of precedent. That I'm was an saying, epic fumble by KT. I'm just saying sometimes you make the wrong choice, Monty. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes you make the wrong choice. Sometimes <laughs> oh, sometimes you it. just throw in in your picks. Yes, <laughs> I mean, but that was a combined failure of both. You know, they first off, it was the right choice at the time for KT, in my opinion. It yeah, was a logical I choice, for that as well. but the execution of that choice in terms of trying to actually put pressure on Faker in the draft was fucking horrible. So, and also to T1's credit, they did play better than we thought. They did play better than we thought. Faker did bounce back better from his injury than we thought. 
But I mean, you can't blame them after T1 looked completely miserable with Poby in the mid lane and was just on, you know, losing all these matches and looking terrible in terms of their macro. Yeah. But, who, you know, the, who, at the end of the day, Wolf, right. what we, they didn't anticipate that the injury was not, in fact, to Faker's mouth. So he could still tell the players what to do and where to go, even if his hand was not working properly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, nobody could have known that T1 was going to have that kind of crazy bounce back and. I'm I'm hoping that, you know, I can, I I can't analyze and and say I think this is going to be likely. I can't I can't predict this is going to be likely. But I'm hoping that nobody knows that D plus is actually going to make a sick run. Nobody knows Hanwha is actually going to upset and go to the finals. Um, right now we don't know, but the possibility is there. But what I can tell you guys is that I feel like, like I said, it, it was a zero percent chance for me that D plus has anything going on in the uh in the playoffs last week. Now I'm thinking it's 10%. So, um, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying like, we've, we've, we've made progress. We've made progress. Hanwha also a little bit more likely to potentially make that run to finals. Um, Look, I, as far as Hanwha goes as a, as a mighty peanut enthusiast, Wolf, I was much happier to see his gameplay, particularly him back on the poppy in a great game for poppy. Um, this past week, T1's drafting should never al have allowed him to have Poppy. That was insane to me that Poppy made it through all, all those bands uh, by the time Peanut actually selected it because it was just the perfect pick. Um, and Hanwha also kind of threw drafting game number two, which was not great to watch uh, because like th basically both teams were running back the same drafts and Peanut's like, yeah, now is the time for Lee Sin. It was not. Please, not the time for Lisa. <laughs> please, I know you've been a great Lisa in at times in your career, Peanut. You're not that guy anymore. You are Maokai Sejuani Poppy guy, Vi guy. Please, no more. Please, no more, Lisa. It was bad. Um, but just looking at looking at the drafts and looking at Peanut's performance, I mean, these were the kind of Peanut games that we want to see out of Hanwha, where we get to see, you know, solid like counter picks, intelligent picks, intelligent pathing around those picks. You know, kind of a dominant. Uh, choking style in the jungle where you kind of just slowly increase the amount of pressure, good dives. I mean, this was, this was, especially game one was just a vintage like peanut performance from the last two, three years. And it was fun. It was fun for fans of peanut like myself to watch. Yeah. I mean, Hanwha has kind of gotten a huge buff uh, in that Ari is relevant again. And sure. uh, it's another champion that Zeka can play um tristana still you know ending up being quite relevant i don't know i mean Zekas had some up and downs on that champion but i do kind of generally consider tristana to be a good pick for him so uh zeka is feeling very good in this meta uh, surely he can play annie too i mean we have to assume he can play annie uh i don't know surely it is kind of a like press stun towards someone and then use your abilities um kind of champion I, but it does rely on using brain for proper engage angle <laughs> and like he's good at he's like i can use my brain to yone ult but annie he's, ult... he's played seven games of annie in his career and he's four and three surely he can play this champion you know I think he wants to be the Ari playing into the enemy Annie. Um, I think he does not want to be the Annie playing into the enemy Ari. Um, I'm not ready to trust Zek as Annie. I, I, I mean that that stat that you just get. I was gonna look it up too because I was like, I feel like he's not he's not gonna have like he's not gonna be like uh, one and nine on it or something like that. But I don't remember being inspired by his Annie when Annie was the pick, and also. Seven games is not a lot, considering how relevant she's been um, throughout the, the course of his time in the LCK. So it seems like there might be some any avoiding going on for him. <laughs> he hasn't played it yet right now when it is very strong as well. So I'm feeling like maybe don't. I mean, that. consider this, Wolf. He just had a good Talia game, but he has a 36% win rate on Talia in his career. Well, that was that's not a surprising stat, and that is true. He did have a good Talia game in Game Three against uh against T1. He ended up getting POG, and uh, I mean, I, honestly, Zeka's stats are kind of wild for a, a world champion mid laner who ha who has 217 wins and 190 losses in his career. He has over 400 games played, guys. Let me tell you, 
champions he has under 50% win rates on that he has played double digit or more times. Okay, so at minimum 10 games, under 50% win rate. This is going to blow your mind. LeBlanc, 28 games, 42% win rate. Zoe, Gallio, Oriana, Twisted Fate, and Talia. That's pretty fucking sad, honestly. I mean, knowing Zeka, though, none of, not even one of those picks. It's not surprising, knowing <laughs> Zeka, but it is sad and pathetic that he could have under 50. Per- he could literally have over 50% win rate in his career, but have under 50% win rate on those champions with more than 10 game play, 10 games played as a professional mid laner. Oriana Wolf. Yeah, I mean. Oriana. Yeah. LeBlanc. That's mm-hmm. fucking bad. I mean, as a world champion, yeah. That's that's not it. Especially with a career as long as his is. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm like, eh, I can, can I defend him? Nah, not really. Um, <laughs> I mean, we do this we do this on the show, like, where we talk Me- about... Meanwhile, the- Silas, 65% yeah. win rate. Akali, yeah. 72% win rate. Exactly. Um... He Tristana, have... 66.7%. Quirky, 64%. Because the Quirky is 64% is actually appalling. Well, he's spammed Quirky. He's just a passenger, man. He's spammed Quirky into weaker teams last year um, a lot. I mean, and... he did win Quirky games this year where he was playing really badly. Yeah, like he 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 just uses the package and pokes people with Quirky. He can do that. Um, I, I'm not here to like shit on Zeka, but he definitely... He definitely I am. has a champion pool that <laughs> is pretty defined and he has not developed it. Like that's that's the thing about Zeka that I think people don't realize is that they like Zeka fans see his good games and his uh, when he's on his best champions and they go, "I can't believe like Wolf and Monty would would you know talk trash on my guy because I, I saw I I watched him play Yone last week and he got like a four man ult and I I love his lane prior when he plays this pick." And have you seen his Akali? I'm like, yeah, I've seen his Akali. But it's not strong right now. And and Yone's falling off in this meta. We're not seeing people pick it. And so he does end up being a liability sometimes. But going back to the original point, he got the Ari. The Ari is back. That's good. That's a good thing. That that he that's one of his good picks. And so, you know, we will criticize everything else, um, besides his very narrow champion pool. But if it, his narrow champion pool is relevant, it's a good time to be a Zeka fan. And it's very easy. And I think he can suddenly play Talia now. It was one game, but it was yeah. a good Talia game, legitimately. Yeah, it was. It was very good. So slightly like widening it. You know, for a while we were saying his Azir when he was on DRX was extremely bad um, for for a player of his caliber. We were not happy with his Azir. His Azir has slightly improved. You know, it's been going up and up. I would not say his Azir is bad anymore. I would say it's it's good enough. Um, for for what his ear does, he's he's developing as a player. It's just very slow, and that's the frustration with me with Zeka, is that if you're uh, you're, he's kind of he's like almost on the closer zone. Like if he was on a worse team, people would compare him to closer, and closer is like a, a bottom four mid laner in the LCK, if not worse. And he has a similar issue to Zeka in that he has a very narrow champion pool and has a very specific play style. And I think if Zeka, if you just put Zeka on um on Live Sandbox on, on Fear X and he wasn't popular and he wasn't a world champion, no one would enjoy this guy. They'd be like, oh, he can only play Yone. The thing is he's a world champion. He got a lot of fans. He played a he was a patch Zerg, you know, and he played a lot of uh, really strong champions at the time. And so people love him and that's that's warranted. But we will criticize his champion pool and people will then be angry about it for some reason. But that's it's just the reality of it. Like look at the numbers, look at his stats, look at his gameplay. Uh, the Talia game was good. That's the gameplay that you you want to hold on to tightly if you're a Zeka fan. Like, look at that gameplay and and, and cherish it. Um, some really nice flips with the seismic shoves, and that's that's the Zeka angle. Um, hope that he can actually figure out that stuff, and then maybe he could be a legendary mid laner. He's not in the conversation with with Chovy Faker, and in the past Showmaker, he, he's not in that that conversation right now. He has to make a, a wider champion pool if he can do that. I mean, think about it, it, for him to be considered a top three mid laner, which it, BDD was as well. Uh, it's tougher to say now. Um, you know, you think about these players' champion pools. BDD can play anything. Faker can play anything. Chovy can play anything. Showmaker can play anything. Like literally anything. 
They, that's why they're so powerful in draft. These players c- can have these pocket picks. They will, you know, Trophy will play Scion mid. He'll play Cassante mid. Cassante, yeah. Out. And Zeka, he can't do that. So hopefully one day he can. Otherwise, you know. It's it's too late for that. If he was going to be that guy, Wolf, he would already be that guy. That's what I'm He's saying. Like, well, he, the development <laughs> hasn't been there. The development hasn't been there. <laughs> Everyone else has improved. Why is Zeka still holding on to a few champions? That is a limiting factor. I love his good ones. And I love, you know, when he has a random good game with Talia. I, we have to keep going back to that because he, I did not expect him to get no Talia in, in a clutch game against T1. I did not see that one coming. All right, well, let's look forward just a little bit here because we we do actually, as you mentioned, have some important matchups. Um... Well, seeding it may not be the biggest issue. Like Kwangdong's week and Firex's week is probably the most important one because e- either of those teams will get bopped by Hanwha, but making it into playoffs is actually an important accomplishment. And Kwangdong has completely dropped the ball. Uh, they are not the team that they showed off in the earlier parts of the season. Uh, and now they have a tough week ahead of them where they basically have to win one because Fear X's week is so easy. And we don't want to see either of these teams in the playoffs, but Kwangdong's fall from grace after, I mean, they've started five and three. Well, five and three. Yeah. And they're six and 10 now. How do you go one and seven when you're playing most of the bad teams in the league? Uh, well, I think they got pretty figured out um, in draft. And we've talked about it a lot. Obviously, full early game pick. Bulldog, late game pick. That's the, the drafting style. But yeah, I mean, like, D-plus and KT are their opponents, I think, with what we saw from D-plus this week. Again, yeah. assuming D-plus is going to continue to be relevant, they need to prove that and, and smash Kwong, but I think they will. KT feels like a coin flip every time they play. That that one does feel like if you're Fear X, that's the one you're worried about, is, oh, man, Kwong might actually just randomly beat KT. because KT- It's also the last game of the regular season, which is exciting. It's literally the final game on Sunday night, and that could affect fourth and fifth place seeding as well as who gets the sixth yeah. place playoff seed, which is pretty fun. It's so, a pretty fun way to end the split. So funny how, you know, Fear X could, on that same day, beat Bro, and just be <laughs> sitting there waiting to see if Kwong Dong rise to the occasion or just mess it up and go six and 12. And by the way, especially Wolf, because that's one of those games that is very unlikely to matter for KT because KT, basically it doesn't matter what happens because whether they're fourth place or fifth place is irrelevant because they will play D plus no matter what. And then it'll just be whichever teams, you know, who gets selected after that point in time. So actually the difference between fourth and fifth place seeds is meaningless in the context of LCK playoffs. So KT may be trying some wacky shit. They probably just don't want to show strats at that point in time in preparation for playoffs. So they could just, you know, intentionally kind of like fuck around. They could just happy game that entire series, which which would fuck up Fear X. And also because it's funny, um, yeah. right? Like, so like Challengers team or something like they did last last season. <laughs> like, you could absolutely do that, Wolf. That's the crazy thing is you could absolutely do that. For, if you guys um, remember last time Fear X and Kwong Lung were in a very similar situation, well, it was Live Sandbox at the time. And then KT just played their Challengers team randomly and Kwong Lung was yeah. like, Hey, here's I'm the thing. Playoffs over here. Like, can you guys not do that? Can you guys not fuck this, around while I'm trying to go to playoffs? <laughs> this doesn't matter for KT. The most important thing for KT will be beating D plus the next week because the way that the LCK playoffs work is that, you know, basically you don't get into you know, you don't necessarily get into like just not going into losers bracket is far more important than this match, basically. Yeah. It's far more important. I mean, I think obviously winning is meaningful to KT and their fans and like fifth place. Yeah. And and here's the other thing. You don't get into double elimination until you actually hit the second round. So like if you want to get into the double elimination por- portion of the bracket at all, because it's one and done. So we're going to see D plus or KT eliminated. One of those two teams will just be eliminated from playoffs in the first round. So the stakes for KT are going to be way higher for that match. So uh, th- I think you're absolutely right, Wolf. They might just put in their their challenger roster again. Like who cares? Yeah, I, I think I think they will try to do something like that the fans enjoy, and they will try to win. Like they will take it seriously. I'm not trying to say that KT is just going to show up and and just like 
you know, pick Timo because who cares? Because competitive integrity um, is is important, obviously, and, and like trying to win win games is a um, like it's basically extremely disrespectful if you if you don't try hard, even if you don't have to. Um, in in Korean culture, we we see this obviously in in basically all of esports. Like people do generally try. You don't see that many Naniwa pro brushes, right? But um, the the way in which they try and how boring they can be with their comps as well, where they just pick something extremely generic, even if it's not necessarily the strongest thing, they can just you know pick Zaya or something and not care. It's, their options are are very open, and that's why I think that Kwangdong KT is the most likely path for Kwangdong to go um, to the playoffs. D plus, on the other hand, I think is really trying to hunker down and, and try to get Lucid a little bit more experience trying to do uh, late game stuff. And I think they will take their week a lot more seriously, even though they also have the Hanwha series, which they could prove a lot there. Um, even though for them, likewise to KT, it doesn't matter that much. Um, and they are going to be moving into a new patch uh, going into playoffs anyways. So it doesn't necessarily matter, but I do think um, the week in general is interesting in that Gen G do need to win their games probably to get first place. So their games will matter. They will not be interesting, but they, they do matter. Um, same for, for T1. Obviously they have a pretty easy week, Nongshim and DRX. And then we're going to say bye to, you know, all of our teams that are already eliminated from playoffs. You know, DRX, Nongshim, bro. Um, they, they have a week to play. Um, they get to play spoiler potentially. DRX. I'm really sad. DRX is not the team that's contesting for playoffs because I actually think they're better than Firex on paper. And I think could have done more. Yeah. I, I think DRX was some of the, the kind of shifts that they've made, but they, they've also been pretty egregious smolder abusers. So like, I'm not ready to say they're better yet because like Teddy on smolder has been a massive factor behind their success. And smolder has made ranking teams very difficult because they're just fraudulent smolder teams. Look, Wolf, if smolder hadn't been released, Kwangdong would be in playoffs. Facts, actual facts. Smolder is what ruined Kwangdong's, you know, lock on the playoffs because it was Smolder that was beating them on Bri. It was Smolder that was beating them on DRX, right? And their refusal to to deal with this champion. So Smolder has really warped a lot of results and caused a lot of upsets. And I think when the Smolder meta goes away, I think DRX hurts a lot more for that because they've been leaning very hard on Teddy. I, I do think that's true, but I I think that they were able to identify how to to pilot the meta really well and uh yahoo is way better um than sure. Seb, and i like that they were bold enough to finally put him in and, and give him a shot and then keep him in uh whereas nongshim is just kind of a revolving door in terms of the you know fiesta versus call me um situation and they haven't really been able to figure out what their identity is whereas drx definitely said this is what we want to do and they they honed in on it they played very well they did put frog in that one time which didn't work well, and Rascal has had a pretty tough season. But uh, my my point is, I feel like DRX is a way more interesting team. I don't think they would beat um, Hanwha, and, and the playoffs wouldn't be interesting for it, right? But kind of wish it was them, because at the end of the season, they're looking better than Firex and Kwangdong to me. Uh, and the end of the season matters more to me in terms of your form than what you looked like in, in weeks three, four, whatever, etc. But... As it turns out in the round robin format, um, what you looked like in weeks two, three, four, five actually matter, and uh, you will not be going to playoffs, DRX. Sadly, uh, even though you are the better of the non-playoff teams right now, but you know, just wanted to give them a shout out, and we'll see if they end up playing spoiler to either T1 or Gen G. I doubt it, but we've seen crazier things in week nines of the LCK. Fair enough. All right, guys. Um, also, as a reminder, even though this week is the normal schedule, you've got the audience coming back. Are you excited for that, Wolf? Yeah, I am. And I'm really excited to not uh, have to do the uh, the fan chant thing at the beginning. Of the I, that game. was my favorite part the last couple of so weeks. Funny. It was so fun. It was so funny, but it also became like so hard to keep interesting as, as the week went No, on. you guys did a ton of different voices. You, you kept it fresh. I, I enjoyed it very much. I just prefer the, the actual fans um, to, to us, to our fake fan things. It was, it was very fun. And it was, it was definitely one of the, the weird and wacky things that one of the weirdest and wackiest things I've done um, on the LCK since I joined, but uh, I'd rather have the fans there. It has felt the atmosphere at Law Park and the atmosphere at the LCK has felt very, I don't know. I don't want to say it's been like this feeling of dread or this feeling of 
um, hopelessness. But during the DDoS attacks, like the the atmosphere of everyone there was so unhappy, right? Everyone was very annoyed with the situation. They had to come in early at weird hour, yeah. pre recording all that stuff. Then we went live this week, so that was great. And well, we now got- that it's over, how early were you actually going in for those games? I'm curious. Um, so often like two or three hours before, actually, generally speaking, since it doesn't have. To oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. I wanted people to think that maybe we were going in at like six o'clock in the morning, just so right. I didn't know. Lots of attacks couldn't. I, I couldn't tell anyone, right? But like, I was like, I'm going in really early, and people were like, really? I'm like, yeah, it's really early, but actually, it was is mostly just a few hours before. Um. And and people pretty much know that now, but I wanted people to think that it could have been at any time, so that you know, DDoSers could. Uh, right. Not... No, I get that. But hey, we 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 got LAN, you know. By the yeah. way, this it is happens. A, it's a it's a funny conversation that we we didn't really have here uh, on the Monty Wolf Show, but the fact that we were able to get that, which is insane, and and it's so shocking that um you know Riot agreed to to give us the the special um client slash server um. It's pretty insane. So the players are now playing on guaranteed one MS ping every day. So it feels like a huge win for the. LCD. So you're going to use that server no matter what now. I assume so. I mean, I don't. Hmm. I don't know what, what will happen in the long term, but for for now, yes. Um, so now we have that. We have the fans coming back, and um, it's it's a hype hype time to be an LCK fan. Playoffs are starting soon, and no more no more sad feels. No more empty low park. Uh, and walking up to the caster desk in a cold, dark, quiet studio. No more of that. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad for you. I'll miss the. I'll miss the cheers that you guys did, though. I will miss that part of it because, like, the the fan experience doesn't do anything for me because I just watch vods most of the time. So it was actually more entertaining for me to hear you guys do the fan cheers as part of my viewing experience. Um, but yes, good to have the fans back. Uh, glad to, that Riot was able to fix everything up and actually put the LAN server in there. So it seems like, you know, we've been critical of the LCK and the way they handled this issue in the past. I think they did a great job of handling all of this. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, the, alternatively, we would have had to probably delay the season. Um, doing the pre-recorded stuff was... It was a smart fun. move. And like, I like their iterative system of like, okay, then we're going to do it at the real time with no fans so that the fans aren't inconvenienced in case there's an issue. It just really seemed like they handled this properly. Yeah, they handled it properly. They communicated properly. They made consistent statements about the reasoning for the decisions. And uh, I feel like this is one of the best handlings of a controversial issue that the LCK has had um, over the last few years. Obviously, the COVID handling was very good as well. Um, but the um response was quick i mean part of the COVID handling included uh you know forcing teams to field rosters because they couldn't possibly say no to the asian games so that that still was hot bullshit i i was mostly referring to like how the broadcast was run when teams were playing from home Ah. and and like the production aspects of it yeah not not perfect in that in that regard that you mentioned but I thought the LCK had basically the best online show. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, I, I can agree with that. It's org. So. But yeah, uh, hopefully no more issues, but I can't imagine that anything will happen. Obviously, you know, the, the main thing that LCK was telling people was that, like, DDoS attacks could still occur to sure. the internet, at, you know, at Law Park, for example, and then affect the broadcast going out live. But it, seemed but it like won't affect the games, client. which is yeah. the most important thing. And it seemed like it's mostly a client um issue that was being exploited so i don't think that the ddos tax will ha- will hit lol park or hit the the broadcast itself as much so i think we're safe monty i don't think there's going to be any more issues i think we're. i hope good. that's true <laughs> in before day one four hour delay uh <laughs> It actually can't happen now, though. Like, the worst thing that would happen, guys, is that they just uh, turn off the broadcast, record the broadcast, and then release the broadcast later. So, so it seems like, if they have the LAN yeah. server now. Yeah, that At was, least that the games could get played, and maybe the broadcast gets recorded and delayed, but they can actually just play the games, which is which is the most important part. And they could show the games to the fans live while that's happening as well, because sure. they can stop yeah. from playing, so they can just keep it on the screen and right. show it later, so. Yeah. Seems like a good solution. All right, guys, we will be back next week to playoff preview. Very fun times. So we will see you then.